Aureline Broussal from France. Wow. Nice to have you here. <laughs> wow. I don't know what she said, but uh, it seemed very impressive. I, I was impressed myself. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's my second time in, uh, in Finland, and the first time I was really welcomed, and I really enjoyed myself. It's a lovely country with lovely people, so I'm really happy to be here again. Um, so I've been invited to speak uh, at the beginning uh, about strength and conditioning for, for, young, sorry, it's for young players. Uh, for young volleyball players, and uh, eventually I will speak uh, as well about, uh, about judo in a, a more practical uh, uh, intervention. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been working for volleyball for um, about three years now as a head uh, research and development. So most of my job is to get the young lads to the national team. Okay, so I've been focusing my, uh, most of my time on researching how we could develop, how we could increase uh, their level safely and make a better pathway for them uh, to reach the top. And so, um, uh, obviously, you, you, you don't know the French system, but it's very pyramidal. It's quite efficient, actually. We got a, 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 a basic selection uh, all over the country with uh, performance cells. It's kind of regional centers, a little bit like this one. And we've got, um, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe 20 all over the country. And, uh, and then you go to a, a, a regional, more centralized center, and then you go to INSEP, which is the Olympic uh, campus. Um, for volleyball, it's a little bit more specific. Uh, the, uh, the national campus for the senior, senior teams is in south of France, uh, much more comfortable in the sun, and they're enjoying their time in Montpellier and Toulouse. Okay, so that's, that's basically the, the system. So the good point is you get people from the bottom to the top, and you don't miss people. Everybody goes through the filter, and at the end, you get the result of it. Okay, so that's quite an efficient way. The problem is when it's been formatted, uh, like when it's been programmed, like 20 years ago, then you get something that is really rusty. And to change it, it takes quite a lot of time. So, um, sorry, the, my first example is from judo. I don't know if many people here know judo. But uh, this guy is, uh, is pretty much in judo, or Usain Bolt, or Roger Federer. Okay, he's eight-time world champion, uh, and, uh, and he's going to be uh, probably four-time <laughs> uh, Olympic champion by the, by the end of the, of the decade. So on this picture, this guy is 19 years old. It was his very first title. Okay? And so it's the uh, best illustration I had. To, um, to make people think biological and no longer uh, chronological. Okay, so clearly two players uh, can look the same age chronologically, but definitely age differently. So if you take a 14 years old, for example, you get, by, by statistic, by research, 23 centimeters difference in average and uh, 18, ki 18 kilograms. So it's totally different people. Okay, so you obviously can't train them the same. So we like to think things like pre-puberty and then the first stage of puberty and the second stage of puberty, but this all is very theoretical, okay? And w the message we try to deliver in, the, in our centers is be careful because the group you are doing, this is purely theoretical. Some of them might be way ahead of that and some of them might be way beyond. So we've got um, we to keep this in mind before, before we plan anything. So generally, the, um, the different stages we've got, we try to provide some indications to the coaches. So, for pre puberty we, we aim mainly at motor skills um, while the, um, the metabolism is stable. And uh, obviously, it's a, it's a great time for general ability improvement. So we try to keep people in that period of time in um, global education in sports. And um, it's, it's easy to say, really, but most of the coaches, they go straight to the point and most of them, they just don't give enough 
general culture of sport to, uh, to their players. And the part of the problem is the school education, because we've got the PP, okay, the physical education in school, and uh, it's not P at all in France. I don't know how it is here, but it's not P at all. They just do different sports, and they don't teach how to warm up, how to stretch, why we would do that, how to control your body, how to maintain your body. There is no education whatsoever. So what we try to uh, implement is a lot of that. Um, for the second phase, uh, it's much more complex. And obviously we go to a basic metabolism and uh, hormonal system growth very quickly. And the motor production and the effort capacity is challenged. So again, this is a period very specific. And most of the coaches, they just don't take it on board. And the last, uh, the last phase is probably the, the easier one because it goes back to a, sl uh, a slowing growth. Mental and physical skills are improving quite per permanently. And it's a better global uh, body balance and uh, harmony for better coordination. So, sorry. So what we try to what we try to do. I'm sorry. It's a little bit. It's a little bit uh, unclear on that. I try to uh, I try to spot it for you. So mm, it's not working really well. My stuff. I'm sorry. Here we go. All right. So here, there is the performance cell. Okay. So that's the regional one. And the problem we've got is that we're right in the middle of the peak growth here. And so here the growth is accelerating massively, and we've got people that are changing so fast that sometimes I go for uh, like a national tour uh, early in the year. Six, month la six months later, I don't recognize the people I've been testing six months before. They change so much. They, they put five, six kilos on, they grow a beard, they, they become like proper, proper men for some players. And so obviously, the, all the testing we do, well, most of it is irrelevant. But I'll come back to it later. So what we try to, uh, what we try to communicate on is, OK, we've got this, um, we've got this, uh, this situation here. And around it, we've got some nervous dominant training at the, at the early stage. And then we go for hormonal and nervous training. But this can move from left to right according to the people we're coaching. So we really need people to be aware that there is no fit, one fit-for-all system. And that's what we've been fighting, because everybody is training the same way year after year. That's how the system was. So what we try to implement as well is um, this Canadian vision, you know, we've, I've seen some, uh, I didn't understand all of it, but I've seen some of the progression I've, I know from uh, long-term development of, uh, of young athlete, which is uh, very popular on, uh, in um, North America. And the Canadians, they've been very proactive with that. Okay? And uh, so wh what we try to explain to our coaches is the, um, is the pyramid thing. So, uh, again, you get the chrono chronological age in the middle of it. Okay, so, okay, you were born age zero, and when you're five, you enter to a general preparation and go through fundamentals. Okay, that's the basic system. But that's not the only thing that um, will influence the system, because here, you have the general training age, and this is the age you've been, you've been doing things. And in France, most of people, during the very early stage here, three, uh, during uh, here, uh, before, before five, five years old, most of them, they do judo. So it's very specific. When they start volleyball at six, seven, they're not empty of uh, motor skills. They, uh, they're not zero knowledge. They have some background already, okay? And if you take two children, one that didn't do anything before volleyball and one that did judo, gymnastics, or whatever you can do before five, it's totally different to a person. And then you get the specific age on top of that. And so all this age combined 
are kind of fast-tracking the pathway. And that's what I try to explain to coaches when, when we give them the methodology. We say, watch out, because even if it's a team sport, you're going to have to individualize. You're going to have to split the contents. You're going to have to make sure that we, we spend time on general pre preparation and fundamentals if they still need it. Because if they don't, you're just wasting time, precious time. Um, and then don't swap the, each, each part of it, because of, obviously the learning to train is very important. And again, another very big specificity of uh, volleyball in France, even though we have today a very successful national team, it doesn't uh, reflect the level of uh, volleyball in France. Volleyball in France is a very small sport. Not many players across the country, so the opposition is very poor, and you can access to elite performance very quickly. Much easier than in, uh, than in uh, judo, than in football, than in tennis. So some people, when they arrive here, they have no experience whatsoever. And they're here, they're like uh, 13, 14, sometimes they're coming from the islands uh, of the old uh, colonies, because France has a lot, a lot of them, okay, New Caledonia, uh, Tahiti, stuff like that, where got, you've got strong and tall people, and they come to Metropole, and they're basically beginners. And again, that's another level of individualization. You can't, for this kind of people, go straight to training to train because they didn't hit the previous, uh, the previous boxes. Yeah. So for the girls, it's, uh, it's pretty much the same, except, um, except everything starts a little bit earlier. Okay, they're always, uh, to, to make it simple, they're one year or two years, uh, two years ahead of boys. It's never good to generalize, but uh, most of the time it's like this. So again, training girls and boys can't be done the same way. Okay, but that's uh, very uh, common, common things. So when we get to specifics, one of the problems we have, specifically in volleyball, is the fast happening growth. Because remember, we pick up the tallest people or the people that are going to be the, 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 the tallest. And how do we know that? Most of the time, your son of a player. And most of the time, you're a son of a player and a player. So when your two parents are two meters tall, there's a high probability you end up very tall. But it can happen late. Okay, so that's uh, a problem we've got many, many often. And so if we, again, if we generalize the, the period, you know that in between 11 and 15, exactly the time we're going to ask them to become, to turn into an elite performance player. The time we will transform them into uh, uh, elite performance, we know we're going to alternate quick adaptation and period of regression. And so the, the key things we try to teach to our coaches is patience. Take your time. We got time. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we're a junior champion. It's even not important at all. Shouldn't be. So cadet champion is even less uh, important. And the problem, most of the time, every level try to deliver. They try to deliver performance. They try to show, OK, my center is the best. I try to score in cadets. But it's not the time. It's not the job. The job is to grow with patience. And so uh, we try to explain them through that type of, um, of representation that they've got fragile bone, muscle and joints, uh, can suffer weaknesses and disbalance, and we will go through coordination loss. So yes, sometimes you improve quickly, you get very efficient very fast, and sometimes it doesn't put a foot in front of the, of the other. And this for month, that's it. Take it on board, change it, change your program, change, ma make it different, find a way, reinsure him, explain him, he's changing, that's normal. Okay? And this is where SNC is important because it's much si more simple on the, on the motor side, okay? because we've been talking a lot about uh, Olympic lift and, uh, and mo functional movement and all that. Of course, it's technical, but the technique we need for SNC is affordable. Okay? We can teach that very quickly, and it's much more stable than a, a floating service or uh, some, uh, some very uh, 
precise tactical uh, timing in, uh, in a volleyball, which requi requires an expertise of years and years and years, and goes up and down all the time. Um, plus, they're all beginners, in SNC. Where in volleyball, they all have a competition. So sometimes you're regressing, and your partner is fast growing. And you're like, shit, I'm shit. And at that period of time, the, the psychological damage is much more important than the physical. Because they might just stop, they might just give up. And that we don't want either. OK, so fast growing uh, induced some pathology. We've been talking about that uh, earlier on. So one of the, of the most common in, uh, in volleyball, and I think in all jumping, uh, jumping uh, indoor sports, is uh, Osgood Schletter. So um, ob wh what do we do according to that? So obviously, the medical gives us feedbacks and stuff. But what we advise to do is adjusting the load, framing the joints in terms of giving the, the player all the requirement of stability and control. So it goes, obviously, through uh, functional training. It goes, obviously, through hypertro local hypertrophy. Uh, and it goes through balanced stuff, proprioceptive workout and stuff like that. Uh, but one thing more important than all the others, because most of the time we think just about SNC as a SNC coach, as a strength and conditioning coach, but something I, I learned uh, in indoor sports, believe it or not, people don't know how to jump. They don't know how to jump. You know, the, the picture we, we saw in the, in the previous presentation there, this is a very common thing, especially in women. But it's very, very common. Terrifying. Terrifying. Imagine a, a judoka that doesn't know how to fall. Doesn't exist. Well, in jumping sports like volleyball, in France at least, I don't know about the rest of the world, but it's very common. And so part of the SNC job is to learn to people how to jump. Simple, but has to be said, has to be told. OK, so um, I hope you can see uh, well enough the example. So all the mobility and workout we're going we're gonna to provide is built around uh, four stages. OK, the first stage is to work on the, on the soft tissue. So um, it can be all, all the joints. So it can be two things, really. The first thing can be uh, self-massage which you all know, okay, we work on trigger points, we try to release uh, local tensions, we try to make it work. Uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with uh, uh, trigger point, but I like to take the image of uh, brushing the air of a, of a little girl. Okay, when you brush the air, sometimes it blocks. Okay, so it's a point where if you don't get rid of the, of the local resistance, you're going to break it all. Okay, you're going to take the hair with it. It's the same with stretching. If you don't get rid of the local resistance, you can't brush the hair. So first of all, try myofasci myofascial uh, release. Try to let it go, uh, to learn them exactly the points where there, there are resistances. And that's the first part of the circuit. No matter what we do, we start with that. Or we can do as well some, uh, um, some uh, joint release and like, um, Recenter the recenter the, the the joint with uh, with elastic and stretching. But let's uh, for this example let's uh, focus on the on the, um, on the soft tissue workout. And straight after that, we give them a passive or active stretching. So the aim the aim of the, the the aim of it is to increase mobility right away. But it's not just localized. After that, we need to put it back into a, a, a global chain to, uh, workout. And this is the third, the, third, uh, the third phase, which is uh, pretty much putting back mobility into it. And most of the time, uh, people that are quite aware of uh, mobility stuff, they stop here, where it's important to replace some specific solicitations after that. So it can be plyometric workout. It can be um, more um, complex movement, and sometimes even um, loading movement, because the load itself will help you to go a little bit further in the mobility. So four phases. One, soft tissue workout. Two, 
stretching, three, mobility, and four, loading mobility. Okay, so that's just a sample of uh, what we provide. So in order to teach them how to jump, just know that, just keep in mind that uh, there, there are three phases in the uh, forward jump. Impulsion, flight, reception. And so the, 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 the key technique points are the patella trajectories needs to follow the feet orientation. Okay, so no bend inward, no bent outward. Take off and landing for, from toes. Believe it or not, most of these guys, they take off from part of the toes, so they miss a little bit of the full extension of the, of the ankle. And worth, they land flat feet. Flat feet, and most of the time, straight legs. So imagine the consequences, on the, obviously, on the knees, but also on the back and all the system. So obviously, triple extension is just a fundamental. So we teach, we teach it through Olympic lift, but we also teach it through jumps. And uh, keep the knee, hip, ankle to control landing. So it's about jump technique and Olympic lift. The core of it is, um, is that. And um, believe me, you guys, uh, from what I saw in judo, are much, much more advanced on Olympic lift than we are um, back in France. Um, then comes the spondylolisthesis, which is a spine fracture. And I've been, uh, we've been talking about that before as well. Uh, so for this, we really need to work on the core, to work on the stability of the back connected to the shoulders. We really need to work on trunk rotations because many often people, they just work core training in line. So we need to twist a little bit this, uh, this upper body. We need to work as well on uh, this balance core training. And finally, uh, a concept we try to develop uh, quite massively uh, over, the, over the system is um, our, our, our aerial, our, uh, how would we say that? Our aerial core. Okay, core in the air. Core with no contact on the floor. And I like to describe the, the, the core training in, uh, in, uh, in uh, several phases. The first phase is stable phase, okay, classic uh, plank, uh, classic uh, core training, you know, you know all of it. This balanced one, okay, on Swiss ball, on Bozu, uh, you, know, you name it. And then with no contact on the ground. And that's very specific to all the sports where you jump. Because when you jump to the net and you try to block the attack, then you need to be well solid. You need to be rock solid with, with your core, and yet you don't have uh, the luxury of uh, control on the ground. And uh, so uh, we've, we'll, be, we'll be practicing a little bit some of those uh, exercises, but this is also a preventive uh, approach of, uh, of jump. Very important. So hips, if I, summar if I summarize, hips, uh, shoulder uh, dissociation. Hips, uh, shoulder load monitoring, and uh, specific core training. So here you get the abdominal, the antagonist inside abdominals, and like I said, the aerial core training. Okay, uh, we've been talking th about this uh, earlier, so I won't spend much time on it, but again, the hip mobility, the motricity and balance is uh, obviously something we really need to uh, increase into the programs. Um, We've been talking a lot about functional training, so the first line has been very well described this afternoon. We have been less talking about this balance training, and I think this is something very important because when you land, you not necessarily land in a comfortable position, so you need to be always aware of the limit and being able to control a uh, very uh, uncomfortable position. And specifically about the, this uh, spine fracture, uh, spine fatigue fracture, we have an approach a little bit more specific for the, for the kids that would be exposed to that. So remember, 
kids that are facing a fast growing period, uh, not all of them, but some of them, might go through um, a, a very progressive uh, implementation of uh, over, overhead weights. So we would start from mobility, we would start from control, we would start from uh, understanding the power of the legs, because most of the kids, you know, when they have legs tall as I am, they just don't realize they can go so low, they don't realize they can generate so much power from the legs. So we start from that before we bring up some extra weight very far away from the head. Because remember, we're talking about guys that are two meters tall at uh, 13, 14, okay? So that's not normal people. So sometimes you feel your barbell is heavy and uh, away from your head. Imagine if you have double the size of the, of the arms, okay? So that's very specific as well uh, to uh, that type of uh, profile. So we make sure the previous points are uh, okay. Core training, legs, uh, leg strength and power, and then we go step by step, step by step. Again, we have time. Don't rush it. We have time. Okay, we've been talking a lot about uh, functional training, and this is obviously the big fashion. I'm a huge fan of functional training, but yet, don't throw the baby with the, with the water of the bath. Okay, remember that local training, analytic training, is also very important. Because at the end of the day, functional training is just a, sh a, a, a chain of uh, muscle. And if one piece of the chain is not strong enough, or just not awake enough, we might end up struggling doing all the lunges and fantastic exercises from the, from the functional training. Okay, so don't forget that uh, we need, uh, especially at the early stage, uh, this type of work because it teaches them, it teaches them the, locally the, 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 how many muscles they have. What they, they just don't know. They just don't know. Okay, so they feel it locally. We fight against some disbalance that could grow at that time. And uh, also we need to uh, make sure that uh, we've got everything on board before we start uh, uh, more uh, complex training with weight. So I'm not saying to do only that, but I think a fair balance would be 30% for local analytic training and 70% for uh, more global functional uh, type of training. Okay? And uh, just to convince you about that, we've been testing uh, quite a lot of, uh, a lot of players over, over the years. And uh, we've been, t we've been uh, using actually a Finnish technology for that, you know, the, this M body shorts. So that's quite handy uh, because we, we can put them on during uh, power test in squats and we can put them on during, uh, during volleyball games. So that's uh, quite fantastic. And so if, if we look at it, many often we've got a uh, serious disbalance one side. And most of the time it's one of the hamstrings that is uh, Overactivated during a, during a match, uh, so obviously in that very specific case, we need to activate it through the ch through the chain, through the muscular chain, so lunges, arabesque, whatever. But we also need to reinforce it because uh, at one point there is a lack of uh, there is a lack of strength, there is a lack of strength or activation. So here the local uh, the local work is good. Okay, so in order to know them better, we've been testing them. And the starting point is an injury picture of uh, USA Volleyball in 2014, uh, 2004. So the shoulder, the arms, the head uh, gets uh, almost 30% of injury. The trunk, the hips are 14, and the lower limbs are 51.1. And uh, so on top of uh, natural sports solicitation, we got shoulders overuse, unproper use, uh, back, uh, which is uh, linked to, purely linked to jump technique, LCA, which is, uh, okay, random accident, and ankle, which is also random accident, and uh, over, over prehab. When I say over prehab, I mean two things. The first thing is, I don't know about here, but in France, everybody has been crazy uh, since late 2000s for all the disbalance workouts, working on Swiss ball, working on uh, flat balls, working on uh, bozus. Again, 
it's one piece of the puzzle, it's interesting, but some of them, they've been doing only that. And in the end of the, uh, in the, end of the day, when you play on the field, the field itself, it's not unstable, right? You can trust it. It won't be moving, not like a flat ball. So we can do a little bit of that just to activate this, the proprioceptive sensors. OK, fine. But not just that. And we've been doing a lot of that. So it just creates injury because people have wrong um, standard. They have wrong um, benchmarks. Okay, and second problem is uh, in, in volleyball, they, they, they just put some uh, protections on the ankle as soon as they get injured, and then they just don't remove it. And so after two or three seasons, you get, uh, you get uh, very, very weak uh, ankles. Okay. And regarding all this, the medical and the, um, and the coaches, they've been implementing testing all over the country, again, 20 years ago. And so the problem is, as I said in the introdu introduction, it is rusty. And so the, the performance test is where throwing medicine balls, where uh, half squats, where multiple jump, single leg, single leg jumps, things that can change in three months. Again, you come back three months later, you don't test the same person. So what does it give you? in order to work, in order to monitor, in order to follow. Not much to me. In order to detect, because some, some players didn't get into the structures because they couldn't jump, uh, I don't know, five times with uh, one leg uh, uh, in less than a few seconds. This is silly. This is silly because we are not facing finished products. So you're just missing the point. So, and uh, and uh, there was no functional training. No functional screening whatsoever. So I don't know about you, but uh, I discovered the FMS testing very late. I discovered it in 2009 or 2008, something like that, when I uh, arrived in England. And uh, obviously, the Americans were crazy about it. Uh, everybody was uh, saying, this is the next big, th big thing. And I didn't understand it right away. I didn't understand it because I was testing from my weightlifting uh, perspective and from my weightlifting background, and for me that was far more than enough. Okay, if you can do a proper overhead squat, if you can, uh, if you can do a triple extension, if you can do a lunge, if you can, that was giving me uh, enough. I was completing with some agenda test and stuff like that, and that was more than enough. And uh, when I passed the FMS test on myself, I was uh, 20 out of 21. You know, it's a 21 uh, grade test. I was like, and most of my judo players were the same, so I said, well, this is rubbish. And when I arrived uh, to volleyball, I, I faced a totally different public. Totally different public. Those people, again, they are literally playing wearing jeans and fancy shoes. All right? They can't squat. They can't squat. And we're talking about people that are jumping over the net. So according to this proper handicap, they can achieve so much. But there, we had the results. I, I'm going to show you in a minute. So just, uh, just to make sure that um, everybody knows um, what um, FMS test is, I'm just going to try to play the video if I can. Yeah. So we have uh, quite a big experience into it now. Because we've been testing uh, over well, uh, when when I did the study, it was uh, it was uh, 191. But since we've been testing much much more, um, so we have a quite huge background in testing uh, with uh, FMS. So uh, 200, uh, almost uh, 200, um, 200 tests, 100 girl, 100 uh, 100 boy, more or less, and uh, we doubled it with specific mobility tests for volleyball: shoulder mobility, hip mobility. Uh, and uh, ankle mobility. And the results are terrifying. So uh, just for those who don't know FMS system, it's a three grade uh, ranking. So if you, um, if you get uh, three points, that means full mobility. If you're, if you're zero, that means you're uh, basically uh, injured. And everything in between is something you need to be working on as a priority to make it simple. So if you look at the uh, a clear blue, 
which would which we should have massively it's uh, it's a disaster um, and obviously you can t you can see that um, for the upper body uh, for the for the girls and um, and for some other tests um, they are way below what we should expect at that time so we have um, maybe 20 percent of the girls that are below 12 out of uh, 21 and uh, most of them they don't exceed 16 so knowing that around 15 you're really concerned about uh, the short-term exposure to uh, injury uh, we, we have a serious problem and believe me i've been moving from one sport to the other from one country to the other and it's not localized okay this is something that i uh, find in different proportions or different areas of the body but it's always um, always something uh, we um, uh, we have to deal with and so uh, the boys are not doing any better okay so from 11 to 14 what we test mainly is uh, coordination balance mobility so through FMS speed and agility and from from 15 to 18 we implement more uh, advanced balance testing more mobility so that was the test the specific uh, the specific test i was talking about and i will show you in a minute jumps plyometrics speed and agility and strength so this is basically our or testing battery so we changed a lot from everybody jumps everybody throws uh, and everybody do a plank for two minutes we obviously change that quite a lot and the last thing I will talk about is uh, profiling I will come back to it so the balance test from 11 to 14 uh, is quite simple because what we want to know is how balanced you are but not only from the ankle perspective I want to know also what is your um, hip strategy so we cut the we cut the the feet off and take them to a, a balance test on the, on the knees. So well, you've got all the all the average and standards we use uh, for French volleyball. I'm not spending more time on that. It's quite clear. Just to make sure that they they're quite ready for the test, we ask them to open the eyes, close the eyes, open the eyes, close the eyes, start the test. Okay, so. Um, from uh, 11 to 14, we add to um, uh, the FMS system. Sorry, I'm going to point it up for you because it's quite clear on the screen. So this is shoulder mobility level one. This is shou shoulder mobility level two. These are trunk rotations. This is ankle uh, dorsiflexion. And this is toe touch. And this is V-test. So this is the compl com complementary test we are using for that uh, age. So it's local, specific to volleyball, additional test, because obviously the, the FMS is just a global view. And for this, we just uh, we, we make it very simple, because we need all the, all the clubs to take it on board and use it themselves without SNC coach or without us. And so it's just a black or white result. You're f either you're functional or you're not. So the balance test uh, we use uh, for the, the, the advanced balance test. Uh, you remember the first balance test was uh, ankle and knee. And so the advanced balance test is uh, very much a, a, a physiotherapist test. And uh, again, uh, we try to see uh, the balance between the two legs and uh, if, uh, if we've got a, a big difference or not. And the functional goes a little bit uh, beyond as well for uh, 15 to 18. So we go a bit further on the toe touch. Um, we do it from a uh, platform. So this, this way we, uh, we, this, um, we, we try both legs. So instead of just trying to touch with the two legs, you're going to bend one and then you bend the other. And that, again, that allows us to, uh, to know if, uh, if you're uh, balanced or not. And uh, again, it's, a black, it's just a black or white result, really. We keep it simple. And if we look at it, black or white, again, it's very scary because the pink here is non-functional non for, for the different tests we've been doing. 
So it's the same for, for girls. Terrible. So what we want for a functional volleyball player is shoulder mobility and stability, hip and ankle mobility, core stability, and trunk mobility. Okay, this is what we need to say, okay, this player is functional. This player can play with no, uh, with no risk whatsoever. What we have are ankle locked, stiff posterior chain, weak shoulder rotation, weak lateral shorts, uh, stiff hips and quads, terrible. So I told you already that players don't know how to jump. And this is the last test I'm going to talk about, is the MyJump. Do, does anybody know about the MyJump application on iPhone? Yeah, one, two. Are there a few? Are there a few? OK. So this is, um, this is a, a technique we've been developing in France, and it's a Spanish, uh, a Spanish software, which is absolutely fantastic, because it's been validated at 2% comparing to a, a, a strength platform. And so the idea is, Replica replicating uh, several jumps is to uh, establish a, a, a speed strength profile. But not only a, sp a speed strength profile, we also try to establish an um, ideal speed strength profile. And so the idea is to know whether or not the strength is going to be efficient for you. Because all the time, when you are disbalanced with your, with your profile, when you're not powerful enough, we try to, com to complete the profile with strength, with strength training. We never, we never press the speed button. Even if we do 30% um, of your maximum on squats, and even if you jump, there's still a lot of strength into it because you've got your body weight, you've got the barbell, you've got all that inertia to activate. Uh, so the pure speed, you never get to work on it. So that's why we try to develop specific technique to, um, to, to hit that side of the, of the profile. Okay. So basically, this, uh, this is a very quick test. You jump, uh, you jump with uh, different, uh, different weights on the back. So obviously, you need to know how to squat. You need to know how to jump. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And uh, with the iPhone, you film the, the feet. And from that, you get the height. You get the you get the speed, you get everything you need to uh, set up a profile. And the application gives you right away the optimal profile for you. In order to improve your power, should you work on, f on strength or should you work on uh, speed? So just know that we've got roughly 10% of the players that are strength dominant and should require a, a maximum speed workout. So all these players, 10%, that's quite a lot, 10%, if you make them stronger, they won't jump higher. That's not their pro what, their, what their profile need. So they'd better off be weaker, but faster. And all the 90 other percent don't spend too much time doing speed, because what they need is strength, proper strength. OK, so then we try to improve uh, parameters one by one. So obviously, the, sorry. So the mobility and flexibility is one of our main uh, problems. So you know, all know Kelly Starrett, who refuse a life of pain and stiffness. And uh, one of his main, um, main thing is to say, OK, flexibility is rubbish. I disagree with that, because obviously, flexibility is a matter of control and a matter of soft tissue, but yet, you need to stretch, because when people can't open the legs more than that, and they're going to need to put their bump down on the floor to get a ball, that's definitely a lack of, uh, a lack of uh, flexibility. And in most of uh, Western Europe, we just gave up on flexibility for the last decade, apart from certain sports like taekwondo, like dancing, gymnastics, or stuff like that, where it's part of the sport. All the other sports, they just gave up on it where it's, to me, it's a core um, training content. So we, uh, so we put it back uh, on track. So uh, again, it's not black or white. It is specific to uh, muscle and chain. Forget about things where we say, OK, don't warm up stretching. Uh, don't uh, stretch after workout. Don't. 
depends on what stretching you do, depends on what is your objective, depends on the intensity of it. It's, it's, not, it's not that simple. Okay, so if you do the proper stretching, and that's what we try to teach the, the kids, if you do the proper stretch, it can be used as a warm-up. If you do the proper stretch, you can use it uh, after training. If you, uh, if you stretch enough, all the side effects are stepping back uh, with expertise, because most of study in, uh, in uh, Western Europe, we test people that are not stretching at all. So when you get a, a 20 years old or 24 years old player that has never stretched in his whole life, that is stiff like wood, and you go through uh, 20 weeks, uh, I don't know what uh, sort of study we could do, but like 20 weeks uh, uh, protocol and stretch him, what does, ha what, what does happen in the end? He breaks, obviously. Okay? But what I would like to know what happens if we do it more progressive and if we keep going for three years. Because trust me, the, the Russians, they stretch every morning and they're, they're not uh, slow, they are not exposed to injury. They, so there is something here we're missing. So the more you stretch, the less side effects. Better mobility and range of motion is less injury exposure. Better control is a more acute precision. And better mob mobility and better range of motion is also a better leverage. And in the end, if you want to create more power, if you want to create more power, you need leverage. Power is not just one single muscle or even a, just a chain of muscle activating a maximum intensity. Power is, uh, different, uh, power is different leverage together. And so the more leverage you get, the more you can accelerate, but the more you can slow down as well. So imagine, uh, imagine an attack here. If you've got all the leverage to go here, and then attack. Maybe you won't use it, but yet when you smash it as much as you can, then you know you've got so much time to slow down. So there is no limit. There is less limit. So practically, we've got no time, so stretching will uh, never be a, li a literature perfection. It always has to be a compromise, okay? People, they, they, these people, they go to school, uh, they have uh, volleyball training, they have uh, weightlifting training, they have uh, many problems. So we just, we just do it when we can. That's it. Let's face it. And if it's not convenient, then we don't do it uh, like uh, crazies. We keep it simple. We keep it easy. But at least we do. It's better than nothing. So just avoid uh, intensive stretching after uh, intensive workout. It's just common sense, really. Uh, intensive stretching as a warm-up. That's all, we, that's, all we, that's all we say. So we've got uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, progression, if you like, just, uh, just guidelines, really, uh, that we give to uh, uh, our coaches and, uh, and some of the players. So we've got two options. We've, it's, just a, it's just a methodology, one uh, among uh, others. The first option is uh, the global slash local approach. So basically, we just alternate one day local, one day global, one day local, one day global. And so we've got everything we need, 20, 30 seconds per each uh, exercise. And the, the second option, because I always answer the same question, I have no time for stretching. Find it. Make it. We need it. So if you don't have it, what, what do you do in the morning? You wake up, you have your breakfast, take your time, watch TV. What stops you from stretching at that time? So we provide a very simple morning, morning session with five levels. And so the program is simple. We teach them, we do, we do it once with them or twice, and then they apply it on their own. Or they don't, but we can't train for them, can we? Um, how much time have I got? 10 minutes? Cool. About eight. Ooh, ooh tick tack. OK, so um, for mobility, Again, that's what, uh, what I described earlier on. We've got uh, three stages. The first stage is uh, self-release massage. Uh, the second stage is self-release massage plus mobility. So we combine the two. But we always start with the self-release massage because we need to teach them how to use the ball, how to use the foam roller, how to, uh, how to behave, how to track the point of the, the sensible points. Uh, and, and also, this is m the most addictive part of it, because most people, they don't want to stretch. But when they learn how to self-massage, uh, self 
uh, most of people, they, they get a hook on it and uh, they quite enjoy it. So we start from that. And then we put the stretching on top of it in uh, stage two. And stage three is what I showed you, but with uh, different examples. Um, again, I'll share the, I'll share the, the PowerPoint, so uh, that's uh, no secret on that. You'll, you'll have it, no worries. But uh, you, you understand very well the methodology. It's one, soft tissue, two, stretching, three, mobility, four. Uh, we, put it on the, we put it all together. About strength, with the seven minutes uh, I still have. Um, I like this, uh, uh, this quote. Both coaches and uh, scientists know that it's not possible to turn a donkey into a racehorse. Uh, but with the exercise and training uh, and hard work, at the most, we turn the donkey into a fast and explosive, uh, and to a fast and explosive one. So um, again, the ongoing dispute is uh, a dispute that aim at the short-term result. And we have time. We have time. We take the time. Um, so if you look at the dispute clearly about strength, I don't know how it is here, but in France it's still quite passionate. But the problem was at the beginning unre uh, unreasonable uh, people, unre un unreasonable coaches uh, that caused uh, discredit. Uh, we had injuries due to inappropriate technique and short-term uh, performance focus. And if you look at what is really going on in a gym, you say, yeah, yeah, of course, you're going to get injured doing this. But you're not doing proper lift. You're not doing Olympic weightlifting. You're not doing strength and conditioning. You're doing something else. You're doing rubbish. And it's the same if you don't jump properly in volleyball. It's the same if you don't throw properly in judo. It's the same if you don't train properly. No matter what you do, if you don't do it right, that uh, doesn't help uh, well. So, um, so yeah, yeah, that's also the doping. Uh, so the, the doping ghost over it and uh, all that uh, is uh, uh, mythology. Uh, the basic transposition of adult program, most of, most of the time when you look at the programs for, for, for use that has been uh, uh, in, the, in the heart of the polemic, it was purely because it was an adult program. And uh, also the problem was uh, research because in the late uh, 80s and uh, early 90s, we got some uh, studies that failed to establish clearly uh, the interest of uh, weightlifting uh, training for, for youth. But there were may mainly um, many gaps into uh, these studies, many, uh, many floating parts and uh, many, uh, many things we could say about it. What it proves really is that for light volume and a short preparation, uh, it's hard to distinguish the effect from weightlifting than natural growth. So uh, the question is, strength training bad for kids? The answer is uh, obviously no, it's just different. Uh, lucky we are, science and visions are evolving. A proper technique um, and the progressive training gets us strength improvement uh, independent naturally from uh, natural growth. So no Proof of gross delay of acceleration. Let's stop with that right away. We've got enough, uh, enough info on that. Weightlifting uh, would produce uh, compression forces that could be useful, actually, to bone growth. Um, so weightlifting does not improve only strength, but also jump, acceleration, ag agility. Um, in fact, com if we compare it to other sports, uh, it might be safer. So max strength remains the heart of the debate, and uh, for the kids, well, uh, okay, teenager strength in many modern studies is uh, as trainable than uh, adults, and absolute strength, when we say absolute strength, we mean the maximum of the maximum is much more debated, okay. Um, so spectacular adaptations uh, for teenagers before hormonal peak are more neuromuscular, that's what I was explaining on the, on the first, uh, on the first uh, on the first slide, and max strength is clearly not uh, appropriate for the uh, very young one, but this is just common sense, isn't it? So we are fine with that. Uh, technique control, balance, rhythm versus mass, volume, ultra performance. That's mainly the, the message of uh, our programs. And uh, yeah, that's quite cool. 
So we go for linear training. You know, everybody goes going crazy about non-linear, changing stuff, and obviously this is not uh, good, uh, good for, for kids. They need consistency. They need to go through stages. They need, we need to take time. Don't rush it. Uh, again, monoarticular and local training remains important at the early stage. Global movement is very important, crucial, but it's not the only uh, way. So uh, that's the typical load uh, we, uh, we provide uh, in our performance cells, which is decent, reasonable, uh, really. For, so the approach for, uh, sorry, I, just, I told you I would be a little bit longer. Can, can I have four minutes, two minutes, three minutes, deal? Okay, two minutes. So we have three different ways to do things for uh, Olympic weightlifting uh, approach. We have the global learning system, because some of them are reacting very well to that. Okay, I show you the movement, make it your way, and let's build it from that. Okay, and into it, we load up, unload, load up, unload, and they structure the movement like that. Uh, for more um, classical learning, we've got obviously the uh, divided uh, approach with uh, semi-technical, and we've got the motor skills path uh, with all the uh, functional approach. So we keep it open. There is no like a school of uh, Olympic weightlifting in volleyball in France. We try to uh, make it again as um, specific as possible uh, with uh, the different um, uh, people we might have uh, to face. Uh, so that's the pro more about the programmation. I won't have time to go through it, but uh, basically we have three seasons. So the first season would be the basic, the second season would be the stabilization, the third season would be the development. And into it, I give you all the number of sessions we allow to each of the parameter, prehab, weights, flexibility and mobility, and it's just, uh, again, a way of building up things and make sure we tick all the boxes in the right order uh, before we get to uh, maximum uh, intensity. And that's uh, the global, uh, global uh, long-term development uh, plan with, uh, different, uh, with the different parts. So, yes, you have uh, the technique that goes all the way, obviously, because this is the core. We have, uh, this is a men program, a boy program. Okay, so the girls would be shifted on the left side a little bit. Uh, here we've got the first period of uh, power development. Here you got a second one, third one, and we go up and up and up. The hypertrophy comes quite late into the development, and the strength becomes a priority quite late as well, and very progressively. And we've got that for flexibility, endurance, plyometric, functional training, and so on. And the top of the graphic is what I showed you earlier on, with always our uh, gross peak period, which is quite crucial, and this is where uh, we need to be uh, very focused and very prudent. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we'll keep talking later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aurelien. <laughs>